everyone, and uh, welcome to this live panel session uh, where we are going to talk about the movie The Edge of All We Know, and we're going to talk about black holes as well. So my name is Tina. I'll be the moderator tonight. Uh, I have a background in astrophysics as well as uh, most of my panelists today. Um, to begin with, I'd like to start uh, to give a brief kind of a summary of the movie. So the movie, The Edge of All We Know, uh, I hope you've seen it, otherwise go in, see it immediately after this. Um, it follows two teams of scientists primarily, but we also meet a lot of other people. They all work in different fields of black holes. Uh, and they are the two kind of main uh, teams that we follow. They are trying to tackle this uh, problem what is a black hole and uh, how do they work by different means so we follow the event horizon telescope team uh, through their entire process of observing a black hole trying to to assemble this image that uh, i think we've all seen last uh, year otherwise you've been buried uh, somewhere deep deep down um and then we also follow a team uh, working theoretically on black holes um so we uh, we are going to talk a bit about black holes, but I would just like to say that I think this movie beautifully shows how science is, is a collaboration. So a lot of times we meet these kind of scientists where they're portrayed as these, as these lonely geniuses in a basement far down. But here we really see how science is collaborative. Um, but now let's uh, let's get into that. We have about half an hour to talk about black holes. It's kind of mind-boggling, weird thing that is uh, that are, that is these black holes. So for all of you guys, you'll be able to ask questions on our webs uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, and if you see a question that you'd like us to answer, then like that question. We might have a bit of time here, but I think uh, most of the questions we'll answer afterwards. So. Brooke, Peter, uh, Mayan, and me will hang on later, and then I'll answer some of your questions on the Facebook page afterwards. So write your questions there, and when we're done, we'll go in and answer them. But I'd like to introduce you to our panel tonight. We have Peter Gallison, who is a professor of science, history, and of physics at Harvard University. Hi, Peter. <laughs> He's also the director of this film and a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. Then we have Mayanne Vestergaard. Hi, Mayanne. Hi. One way? Yeah. Uh, who's an astrophysicist at Copenhagen University, where she specializes in supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, and especially those uh, black holes that uh, accumulate mass, so that grows. And Brooke Simmons, hi, Brooke, <laughs> is a researcher at Lancaster University in the UK, and she is also a citizen science expert and a researcher of supermassive black holes in galaxies. So, hello everyone. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Good. Yep. <laughs> I'd like to give the word first to, to Mayenne. Um, so, Mayenne, why do you think that black holes are fascinating? Well, um, I started out into studying uh, active galactic nuclei, and uh, in the 50s, when they first, uh, the first radio telescopes were um, came online, they found all these sources that had very large gaps that shot plasma out to very large distances outside of the, the galaxies. And uh, since then, we've actually been um, under the impression that these energetic engines right in the center of these galaxies uh, probably were black holes, but we didn't know. And the, the fact that these uh, the black holes are the most compact and most uh, um, massive and compact, but also energetic sources that we know in the universe that can uh, not a lot, let alone uh, accumulate a lot of matter that then in the process actually shines so brightly it can outshine the whole galaxy and they'll probably be seen across the whole universe. I just find extremely fascinating that there are some objects that uh, not only are so powerful but so tiny also that they are uh, able to lock up their secrets and make it very, very difficult for us to understand exactly how they work. But we can tell that all the energy that comes out of them through the jets and through all this uh, radiation that is um, coming from the region around the black hole, not the black hole itself, but around the black hole, that has a huge effect on its surroundings, on the galaxies, 
It can actually stop star formation. It can start star formation. It can keep gas and push things around. So we know that these black holes have a lot of influence on their surroundings and therefore also on how galaxies actually uh, evolve uh, from the time they were born to now the galaxies that we see now. So I find that just absolutely fascinating. And the fact that they are uh, not, um, uh, that they're, they're so good at keeping their secret because they're so hard to understand, they're so tiny. Uh, it's only now that we can actually see what what's happening around the black hole. I find that um, absolutely fascinating. So there you go. Thank you, Hoyen. And Brooke, I'd like to ask you the same question. Why do you think black holes are fascinating? Well, I think it's a similar answer, actually, to what Mariana said. I think the contradictions are really fascinating to me. The concept of the black hole, I think it originated in 1755, and it's at heart a very simple idea, just that an object might have an escape speed that is at least the speed of light. So you can say it in, in less than a tweet. And yet, um, even though that concept has been around for hundreds of years, we couldn't even really begin to unlock a, a deeper understanding of that until Einstein, until we had a much more fundamental understanding of gravity, a deeper understanding of that. And even then, we still don't understand so much about black holes. And they are the most compact objects in the universe, and yet they are these engines that are so powerful they can affect not just the galaxy that, that a single black hole lives in, a single supermassive black hole, but also other galaxies around them. And they seem to affect the overall evolution of all structure in the universe. And, um, and yet we still understand so little and it's only very recently that we've gotten kind of a direct image of the region around one um, of these black holes and and so there's still so much to do and so I find that really fascinating. So it seems like it's the unknown part for both of you mm -hmm. that, uh, that's fascinating and Peter that's I have a two-part uh, question for you so first why did you choose the subject of black holes for this documentary and then even when you chose this subject you chose to focus on the event horizon telescope and then especially this team of theoretical physicists um, where it was in the beginning of that process, you wouldn't know that they actually ended up getting any results or the Event Horizon Telescope would get in a, a nice picture. Um, so how did you, you tackle that uh, where possibly years of your work could be wasted and maybe not as good a story as it ended up being? Yes, the, for me, the, um, this, this journey really began about five years ago when with some colleagues we started an interdisciplinary attack on 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 the notion of black holes because black holes seem to be amazingly enough something that in, interested in a fundamental way mathematicians philosophers fundamental physicists theoretical physicists uh, people who were observing in astrophysics astrophysical theorists and a group of us got together and founded an institute for bringing together these different views of what black holes might be. They are the most mysterious, entrancing objects in the world. And it led me, I was trained in, in history and philosophy of science on the one side and theoretical physics on the other, in particle physics. So for me, it was quite a change of my, the orientation of my work, but this was such an interesting problem that I threw myself into it. And then as these projects began to get launched, the search to try to understand theoretically whether Stephen Hawking's great paradox that black holes seem to annihilate all trace of how they were formed. Uh, and that seems to mean that physical laws, we understand it comes to an end with black holes in the region of black holes. That just seemed like such a violation of what we want from science that the effort to try to resolve that paradox uh, with Hawking and his collaborators, Andy Strominger, Sasha Haiko, Malcolm Perry, seemed like a fascinating avenue to pursue theoretically. And then the observational side of this, this Event Horizon Telescope, a collaboration of over 200 physicists scattered around the world, trying to make an image of a black hole. Imaging in science is something that's been a longstanding and 
and central part of my work and in the history and philosophy of science as well as in in physics that I I I just couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> but as you say, there, these needn't have worked out. I mean, it. You know, you, I wanted to make a film that showed science in the making, not a popularization of results already achieved. I wanted to film not um, something that was dead and gone, you know, the race to DNA or you know something like that, but rather to watch things when all of us, including I, had no idea where it was going to go. And to see those ups and downs, to see the struggle, to see the worries about keeping the results confidential, mm -hmm. how, to, how do collaborators work, how even in a theoretical problem do people's different skills and in a way personalities in science play out. I mean, all of this are things that are, seem to me fundamental about understanding what science is. And I wanted to show that to people outside as well as inside science. But as you say, it was something of a miracle that these things worked out on the time scale that I had to make the film, which was four years. And so, uh, but it's, I mean, to see the, the first image of the black hole form on a computer screen after all that work to struggle, to get sure enough that it was right and secure to be able to present it to the world. I mean, within 24 hours of that image being presented on April 10th at 9.07 a.m. and uh, measured on the East Coast time, a billion people had seen it. And uh, mm -hmm. if we had been wrong, it would have been <laughs> catastrophic. So I, I was interested in that, in, in, in this as a gambit and as an experiment to see whether you could show science unfolding. I think we all remember where we were uh, when we saw the picture for the first time, I at least do. Um, and Brooke, to you, um, I think, as I said, one of the things that uh, that Peter really shows very well in this movie is this kind of working together in teams. So every single team that we meet, they work together, they collaborate. Um, and maybe your work in citizen science is the ultimate collaboration. Mm -hmm. that that's where you collaborate with the general public. So what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages of working with uh, with citizen science in this kind of field of astrophysics? Well, I think actually we can take a cue from the film um, to understand that and then just take it a little further. I mean, um, for the, the theorists who were working um, on, on that particular paper, you know, it was a, still a collaboration, but it was a relatively small collaboration. Even then they had to turn to computers and try to do their work that way. Um, there are problems facing theorists even, um, pen and paper theorists even, that uh, still are beyond um, sort of standard human team capacities. And then when you wanna do something like take a picture of the shadow of a black hole, you're gonna need a lot more people than that. You're gonna need hundreds of people. And yeah, there are hundreds of scientists out there. And, and if the problem is big enough and important enough, you can get them to all come together and devote their entire careers to this particular problem for many years. Um, that problem is not the only big or important problem out there. And um, there are further problems that we just have so much data and we just don't have enough scientists to go through it all in a reasonable amount of time. So um, for a lot of these problems where the, the fundamental question that needs to be asked about this data in order to go any further with it, that problem is actually pretty simple. Um, for example, in Galaxy Zoo, which is a, pro a project that I work on, uh, it's just what is the shape of this galaxy? What, what shapes do you see? Do you see spiral patterns or not, for example? And that is really diagnostic of the physics that's going on underneath. But there are millions of galaxies and it's uh, very hard for computers at the moment to solve that problem of you know, the, the type of spiral that's in the galaxy. Um, and that's certainly true when we were starting it as well. And so uh, we just thought, well, people do this naturally. It's part of our built-in pattern detection in our brains. And so um, you know, asking the people, getting hundreds of thousands of people each to contribute not a full career's worth, but just a few minutes, we can still get a huge amount done and do things that we couldn't have done any other way. So we have really, really accurate information because the wisdom of the crowd is really true and um, the crowd is very accurate, especially with just a small amount of training. 
And so we've now expanded that into other fields. Um, certainly astrophysics has a lot of citizen science uh, current projects and also the potential for future projects, um, including projects on black holes. But then we've also had other projects in physics, projects that are in zoology, projects that are in uh, the humanities, and projects that are in things like crisis response and disaster relief. And that's that's not even exactly the same type of scientific research. And so there's a huge amount of potential for this. And it's really rewarding because you get people who are just trying to pitch in and make an authentic contribution um, while they go about the rest of their daily lives. And some fraction of them get really involved and become actually experts in their subject matter. And some of our moderators who work entirely separate other jobs uh, are more experts on certain astrophysical phenomena than I am. Uh, and that's and they're published authors and you know and that's how they want to contribute but others just want to you know look at pictures of like lions with their family on camera traps uh, projects <laughs> and that's equally valuable um, and and so it's really kind of people can take what they want from it and uh, the research moves forward and is able to make significant advances and so it's kind of an everybody wins situation do you think that the event horizon telescope project could uh could have a potential for a citizen science project in the future, maybe? I'm not sure, actually. I mean, we haven't really spoken to them. I know that radio astronomy is actually one of the uh, one of the areas that the computers are actually doing really well. And um, some of the algorithms that were used to make the images are quite advanced. And not, I'm not sure um, how well the humans would do if we asked them to do something similar. Um, I'm not sure it's within a human capability to do the kind of Fourier analysis to do interferometry, <laughs> but <laughs> but there may still be other things I don't I don't know. Um, and that's the other thing about citizen science is um, it's you can think of it as a research method. Um, it's a really rewarding and valuable one, um, but it's one that you should only apply when you need to. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're just you're doing outreach, which is a different thing. It's useful, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, and Sometimes what you're doing is actually trying to make the computers better so that the human attention can then focus on other things. Um, arguably in the Event Horizon Telescope work, some of those alg algorithms are already very advanced. So maybe in those cases, the humans aren't needed, but what do I know? I mean, I'm not actually, I'm not part of the team right now, so I'm not sure what they're working on next and if there are ways that, that people could become directly involved, you know, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I can help. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, Mayanna, to you. Um, so we followed this group of researchers through four years, as, as Peter said, um, and we can see how just in this short amount of time that we have a huge leap in the knowledge that is, is gathered. And, uh, for example, we see the, uh, the first LIGO observations with the gravitational waves, and we see also, in the end, we get the first image of the black hole and new theories with hair on black holes that was new for me but this uh, this fine hair and black holes how have you in your career uh, in this research field seen that it's moved forward how is it when you began and how is it today uh, the research field in, in black holes well actually when i started as a student uh we didn't even know that black holes existed we uh, as i mentioned earlier based on these phenomenal sources that were very enigmatic because they had this very powerful emission from the center of the galaxy. We call them quasars and active galactic nuclei. We presumed that they had a black hole in the center, uh, which all the scientists have already, at the early in the 60s when they discovered them, they kind of went with that working hypothesis because we didn't know anything else that could produce this very uh, powerful emission from the center. But we didn't know for sure. Um, so so at the time, it was uh, really only a theoretical idea that black holes existed. Then, as um, as I was starting in the beginning of starting my uh, about starting my PhD, the first black hole um, in Cygnus X1 was uh, it's a binary star, and one of the, the stars is very compact, but it had uh, you can find the fact that two uh, stars are orbiting one another you can actually um, uh, figure out its mass. And it was determined that the very compact object had a mass that was way too massive for a neutron star, it's like 14 uh, or 15 solar masses, so 15 times the mass of our sun. And um, so it was sort of like by indirect methods, we just 
found out that it had to be a black hole. We didn't know anything else that could be so massive and so compact. Um, but it wasn't until basically uh, just a few years ago we knew for sure that black holes existed because of uh, the LIGO experiments. So, um, but even early then, it, um, early on, people were studying these active galactic nuclei and quasars and trying to figure out what's happening in the center, how does this very compact object in the, in the center uh, actually produce all this emission, and how does it interact with its galaxy. Um, so, but then at the, about the year 2000, people were starting to actually, or a few years before, were starting to measure the mass of this compact object. And around the year 2000 was when they discovered that the mass of the black hole actually uh, correlated with the mass of the galaxy, or more specifically from the, the, the spherical component of the galaxy. And so we could see that there was somehow that the galaxy on large scales knew about what's happening in their very center on very tiny scales, that they shouldn't have been able to communicate because the scales are way too, too different. So it's very clear that something was making the black hole grow very big when the galaxy was very big, or uh, the, the galaxy let the, the could not grow a very big black hole if the galaxy wasn't very massive. So the more massive the galaxy, the more massive the black hole. So there had to be some sort of crosstalk or feedback. People were talking about the galaxy and the black hole were co-evolving. There was some interaction between the black hole and the, the galaxy. And from then on, all of a sudden, uh, AGNs and quasars became center stage. It was the way to, dis uh, to describe how some galaxies, like the electrical galaxies, were uh, formed, because we had no idea how the stars could stop their star formation in a matter of you know, almost years, but in a short amount of time. And with black holes, with sim simulators started making uh, movies and, and, and the numerical simulations showing that the black hole or the compact object in the center could actually heat and, and expel the gas in the center of the galaxy so that no more star formation could happen. So we went from having these weird sources that only some people were interested in to all of a sudden black holes were the way to explain how galaxies change, how they evolve, how they affect their surroundings, and not even just galaxies, but also clusters of galaxies. Because now we see that clusters of galaxies that have very hot gas can have their gas pushed around by the jet from the black hole. And so all of a sudden, black holes is the answer to how galaxies evolve in the, in the universe. And then just in the last few years, we've gone this quantum leap actually show that black holes do exist in the stellar black holes that we see from LIDAR, the, um, where we see the collision of stellar mass black holes, mass black holes of three, uh, 30 to around 30 solar masses or 10 solar masses are colliding and giving a very specific signal that could not only be from black holes, according to Einstein's uh, um, general relativity. And now in the last year, the most amazing thing has happened in that we're actually staring into the abyss on the edge of the black hole. And I just find that just utterly mm. you know, awesome. Yeah, so I, yeah, so it's where, you know, of all our science, we get a little bit of a tear in our eyes. We almost pee in our pants when we saw the, the image because it's just, okay, supermassive black holes that have masses of more than a million times the mass of our sun or more than that are, they do exist. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a beautiful image because this particular black hole is also one of the most massive that we know in the universe based on the measurements that we've been doing so far. We know that these, uh, that M87, um, has one of the most massive black holes. And it's just in our backyard. So yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you, Ryan. <laughs> I think we all agree that, that black holes are amazing. And I think, Peter, for you, you have been in the center of these projects for years now. And we just talked about scientists maybe getting a bit of a tear. And I have to admit, at the end of the movie, I was a bit wet in my eyes from, from seeing this kind of work uh, all coming together. Have you seen uh, have you seen any kind of special type of people, special type of work uh, through all of these hundreds of people that you've met uh, through these four four years? 
who becomes an astrophysics and uh, choose to work with these uh, weird fields of, of science? Uh, yeah, I think that there's something really amazing about these collaborations and that they bring people from dozens of countries, from some 60 institutions, all working together and bringing their different skills to it. Uh, I think that it brings there, we have graduate students, we have an undergraduate working with us, we have all the way up through the most senior people in the field. Uh, I think that the combination of skills, uh, they, there's one thing that I think is in common, everyone there was riveted by black holes. It's not just the experts in other areas. It's not just the public. It's, you know, working on it ourselves was, it was an emotional experience. I mean, uh, one of my colleagues says when she first got the image on the, on the Event Horizon Telescope, she was spending hours staring at her cell phone, walking around with this image that she couldn't yet show to anybody. And I think all of us had that experience, something of a kind of awe and terror looking into that black disk at the center of the uh, of this orange glow of billion degree gas. And we're looking at a black hole that is, its horizon extends out the size of our solar system. I mean, it is an astonishing thing. I think that the, um, yeah, there's collaboration too in making the film. I, I, I do wanna say that working with an extraordinary editor, Child King over all these years, uh, Zoe Keating is one of the, musicians I most admire who composed and performed the music for the film. We had three great animators, Glynis Fox, who did the sequence of graphic novel sequence. We had Ruth Lingford, who did the in motion, stark black and white images that suggested the kind of allegorical aspect of these black holes. Uh, uh, and Bobby Petrusco, who gave us a kind of cosmic zoom out to give us a sense of the scope and scale of what it means to think about who we are, where we are, all the way out to the scales of our distance through the galaxy M87, where the black hole we imaged first was located. So you know, I think that black holes for the people who even who work on it is, is never just a black hole. It's also redolent of all these other meanings of the idea of a, of a horizon that's a one-way passage. You can't come out. We can't completely know what's inside a black inside that horizon we could have uh, one of the my colleagues says every physicist wonders what it would be like to fall through and see what's inside a black hole uh, so i think that this this magic of black holes this philosophy of black holes uh is there even for uh the people who work on these problems every day. And I wanted to capture that in the film. I wanted the film to be deep inside the practical day-to-day -day work of, but also inside the magic and elusive meanings of this. Black hole is something awe-inspiring of redolent of death or the end state of things, of something that made us think. Um, I think many people who work on the project and my colleagues on the panel here have had the experience of, you know, if you get into a conversation with somebody who's not a scientist and you say, well, what do you do? And you say physics, that's the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. If you say I work on black holes, it's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're right. Uh, our time is almost up, but, but lastly, I'd like to, uh, to ask all of you, and if you can answer very shortly, where do you think the next steps will be uh, in the research of black holes and do you think we'll ever be able to really uncover all of the mystery um i'll ask uh, my first. oh thank you um <laughs> i think with the giant leap that has been happening in the last few years i cannot fathom that or i i would say that i i cannot see that we would not be able to unlock the mysteries of black holes but how we're going to do it that's a big question. I think there's a lot to be learned just from already just having the Event Horizon Telescope. There's so much we can explore. There's also testing general relativity. Um, with LIGO, we can also, I'm hoping we can get a, a more of an insight into what is gravity? Can we detect these gravitons that the theorists are talking about? There's lots to explore. So um, there's, yeah. Take your pick. I think anything will be wonderful. <laughs> and Brooke, what do you say? 
I think for me, the immediate thing that I'm really hoping we get to see sometime soon is also from the EHT. I'm, I'm really um, hoping to see Sag Star, which is the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. And it was the one that was in the film is, um, it's, it's a thousand times closer than M87, but it's also a thousand times less massive. And so it's about the same physical size um, on the sky to us. So, so that, that should be something that we ought to be able to maybe get another picture, but the, they're very different black holes. They're in very different environments and very different galaxies. So I really want to see what those look like. And then longer term, I'm looking forward to the next generation of instruments. Um, LISA is one that's maybe going to be able to look at supermassive black holes in the same way that LIGO is with gravitational waves. Um, and then the next generation of X-ray instruments. I, I'm really excited about it. And what I'm most excited about, I think, is the fact that every time, as a scientist, I love that every time I answer a question, it raises 10 more questions in the process. And so, I mean, I'll never lack for stuff to do as a scientist, but that tells me we're nowhere near the end of this process. And that's, that's actually a good thing for me, that there's always going to be more to understand about black holes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Peter? You'll get the last uh, word. <laughs> well, I, I, I hope that the Event Horizon Telescope can fairly soon deliver <laughs> on the wish to see the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and maybe if luck is with us, even movies of it. Um, a movie's not of the kind that <laughs> we were discussing here. We're, we're going to hold you to that. <laughs> movie, movies of the actual black hole. And, uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a rich field with tremendous possibilities and all the things my colleagues have said. My own somewhat biased excitement is, is right now, so with some colleagues, we've published a paper on the orbiting rings of photons around black holes. And these may be a clue to great new insights. And if we can understand them, they may tell us much more detail, not only about the mass and the spin of black holes, but if we can get a radio telescope out into space of the kind that we need in Earth orbit or even farther out orbiting the moon or maybe even at what's called L2, a spot about a million miles, a million light, uh, sorry, a million miles from the Earth, then maybe we could start to see these rings around many, many more black holes. If we could do that, it would be under, give us a key to understanding black holes the way we understand stars by understanding many stars. You can understand the lifetime of stars, not just by looking at the sun, but by looking at thousands of stars. And if we could see thousands or tens of thousands of black holes uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope, with, a, with Space Telescope additions, um, that would be fabulous. I'd be hugely excited about that. So there are many more things to learn. Um, and we're really just at the beginning. And that, I think, thrills me with a great deal of, of, of joy. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Mayenne. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for everyone for, for watching this. Uh, I hope if you haven't already seen uh, at the edge of all we know, or the edge of all we know, um, then you'll go and see it. Uh, it can be found at the Copenhagen Docs website. Um, so thank you all for tonight and uh, we'll go and see if you have any questions on the facebook page and i have a promise from all of my panelists that we'll answer uh, at least a few of them thank you thank you